And let me tell you something, that, that, that the symbolic account, it, it is a far cry from the literal account. I will say that. It is, it is a far cry from, from, from what the Roman Catholics teach, and teaching that it is literally the body. Now, now the, when we got saved, we told, well, that ain't literal, it's just symbolic. And we think, well, we're doing a good thing now, it's symbolic. But the reality is, the symbol in and of itself has got no value in the covenant in which we are in right now. To take the communion table and put a symbol on it is in reality practicing vanity. Let me show you something to make it a little more clear. I hope I can make this clear to you. Uh, the book of Hebrews, chapter 9. We say, well, it's a symbol. But I want to say to you something. That under the new covenant, there are no symbols. Under the new covenant, God has taken away all symbols. And He does not want us to hold on to any symbols, neither practice the symbol of it. Because a symbol has got no power. And yet we're taking the symbol of the communion table and we're putting all of this religious rhetoric nonsense on it. We're even throwing guilt on the people. Because how many, I, I know for myself, how many times are you sitting there, man, you better make sure you got no sin in your life. If you said something to brother so-and-so that offended them, you better make sure you go to them and apologize to them before you take that communion supper. They're feeding us the same thing that they fed us in the Roman Catholic Church because in the Roman Catholic Church, I couldn't get to that, I couldn't get to that priest unless the Saturday before I went to confession. I had to make sure that I made, made my confession before I took Jesus into my mouth. You see? But what do the, what do the Pentecostals do? What do, Roman, what do the saved, born again people do? They just give it a facelift. They say, well, you can't. You better make sure that your sins are forgiven. The same thing. The same spirit is coming right in. It's just giving a facelift. It's making it look a little better. But the guilt is still there. You see, we think, we think we're doing something that's pleasing to God. And, and I want to say to you something. Oh my goodness, it feels so religious to be holding that, 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 that cracker and that grape juice. It, it, you know, it just creates a religious atmosphere. Oh, this is the body and blood. Oh, it's only a symbol, but... And you're sitting there remembering what Jesus did on the cross. And you're remembering his crucifixion. And God is saying, I'll say the same thing that he said. To, what, what are you doing? Because leaving Christ as a symbol removes the power of Christ. Because Christ is no longer in symbols. The symbols were in effect under the old covenants. Because the reality of it was not there. And as long as the reality of the power of Christ was not present, they needed a symbol to show it. But once the true power of God was revealed, the symbol was removed. And yet, look at what we're doing. We're hanging on to the symbol. First we think that Paul lays down uh, some kind of sacred sacrament institution, some new ceremony, some new ordinance, and we should be doing this every time we come together. And Paul wasn't saying that to begin with. He was rebuking the whole bunch because of their carnality. And then we're taking this communion thing and we're doing nothing but guilt on the people because we think, well, if you've got any sin, if you've offended anybody, then, then God's going to judge you and His wrath is on you, but not take it. And then in the back of our minds, I want to tell you something. I don't care how symbolic you may say it is. That spirit is still sitting there in the back of your head. And man, I tell you something. Yeah, tell me something. Have you ever been in a com so-called communion service where somebody dropped the grape juice? It's like everything got silence. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Chuck. I forgot about that. It's like, it's like something sacrilegious has happened. I, I say that because I remember being in services when that happened. And it's like everybody froze. <gasps> oh my God, what happens? Take a look at this in Hebrews chapter 9. 
verse 10. You see, look, look, look as, as long as we keep the symbols, we're still living in the shadow of something that is not real. Under the new covenant, we have the reality of Christ, and look at what we're doing in our ignorance. We're holding on to a symbol that has got no life, no power. That cracker and that grape juice has no power at all to change you, and the power of the new covenant is no way established in that cracker, in that grape juice, and yet people want to hold on to a symbol, and the symbol is completely and totally ridiculous, valueless in the face of Christ. But you know why we keep it? Oh, because it makes us feel good. And it's not God. I want to say to you something right now. It's not God. It's not God. When people gather together once a month and eat that thing and drink that thing and eat that thing and do it to remember the Lord's death, it's not God. Because God don't want you remembering His death. Did you hear me? God does not want you remembering His death. His death is to be lived out in your life on a daily basis. Paul said, I die daily. If all it is to me is just a symbol that I have not yet crucified, the, the carnality and the rebellion to the cross, that's why I still need the symbol for, because I refuse to crucify whatever is left of me on the cross. Mm. Oh, but it's only a symbol. But there's no power in the symbol. God did away with all... Let me show this to you. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 10. Hebrews chapter 9. Let's take him in verse 1. He says, Then verily, the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly saint. He's speaking about the first covenant. Which was the old covenant. Now jump down to verse 10. Look what he says. Well, look, look at what he says about this old covenant. The old covenant in verse 10. The old covenant which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Meaning the Old Testament saints had to keep these carnal ordinances until the reformation. What was the reformation? The reformation was the, the establishing of the new covenant. When the new covenant came, God did away with the carnal ordinances, with the meats. Look at what it says here. Meats and drinks. I mean, how much more can it be speaking about the communion table? Because that's what the communion table is. It's a meat and drink. And our Paul is saying here, this is nothing but a sin, it's, it's nothing but a sin, which has been done away with, which has been done away with. Those symbols, meats and drinks and carnal ordinances, were done away I, I need to say to you that the cracker and the grape juice that people are holding on to has been done away with. There is no symbol under the new covenant because everything under the new covenant is the reality of Christ's power in us there are no symbols now yes I, 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 I teach from the old covenant I use a symbol of it but you see to teach the symbol is one thing if you realize and understand that the power of it is with you already it gives you better understanding of it but to do something ridiculous as having people come together and gather and eat grape juice and, and have crackers and say that this is something that the Lord wanted us to do, it's completely off base. Let me say it to you. It's completely and totally off base. That is not what God wants His people to gather together and come together and do. No way, no way, no how. It's religious. It's traditional. It's carnal. And it's got no power in it whatsoever. Oh my goodness. No power in a symbol. It's only a symbol and yet we're holding on to it and we're actually having people gathered together in congregations, thousands of people come together to remember the Lord's death. What's the matter? Haven't you gotten saved yet? If you're going to remember the Lord's death, that tells me that you aren't even saved yet. Because only those that don't know Christ have got to remember His death. I don't have to remember His death because His death is a part of my life. I live His death every day. The Bible tells us 
I believe in the book of Matthew, if I can find it very quickly, let's turn to it. Now when he had the, when he had the Passover meal with his disciples, he said something to them. And let me, I hope I can find it. I believe I didn't write the passage down. I do I, I wrote the passage of scripture down. I believe it's in the b- book of Matthew. Let me see if I can find it. If I can't find it, I'm just going to read it to you. Here it is, Matthew chapter 26, and look at verse 29. Matthew 26 and verse 29. Listen to me. When we hold on to symbols, we're actually denying that the reality has come. Because once the reality comes, you don't need the symbol anymore. When Christ died and went into the heavenlies, He did away with every symbol, including the communion table. We look at this communion table and think that it's something that God has given us for us to do. No. He hasn't given it us for us to do that whatsoever. Because God has given us His life, not a symbol. And once His life comes, you don't need the symbol no more. Because a symbol in and of itself has got no power. Read this please with me. Matthew 26 and verse 29. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. He was speaking that before his death. But after he rose from the dead, Paul writes in the book of Romans that the kingdom of God is not in meat and in drink, but in the power of God. That's in Romans chapter 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. You see that word when it says, I will not drink it with you in my Father's kingdom? The word kingdom, is the other word, word for it is gener- genemia, which means generation. Meaning, I'm not going to partake of it with you in this generation. I'm not going to partake of it with you in this physical ordinance no longer. But he says, when I, when I, when I, now when, I, when, I, when, I, when my kingdom now has come, I'm going to partake of it with you. And I'm going to get into that in the second message because people are waiting for a future kingdom when Jesus said the kingdom of God is already here. Amen. For the kingdom of God in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 says for the kingdom of God is not in word but in power. Take a look at this please in Luke chapter 17 to show you that Jesus was speaking. Of, he's, look, before you read, look at this. He says, I drink it new with you. He was speaking it to his disciples. His disciples expected him to sit down and partake of that communion supper with them once again. He was expecting them to do it. And he did do it when he ushered in the kingdom of God. Why do you think, listen to this, why do you think that in his resurrection, Jesus did no miracles, he healed no sick people, he cast out no demons, but you know what he did? He sat on the beach and he broiled fish. Ever wonder why he did that for? There's no record in his resurrection that he healed anybody, that he forgave anybody, I mean, mean, you know, ministered to anybody, that he preached. No record, but but in the record he sits on the beach and he now broils fish and calls his disciples to come in and eat of it because now he was fulfilling the word that he was spoke with them. Because the fish speaks about something living. It's living flesh now. And Jesus is saying, take partake of the living flesh and I will make you fishes of men. He was fulfilling it. He was fulfilling his word to them just by sitting on the beach and partaking of it. And I want to say to you something, that every time we gather and have that fellowship, we're partaking of that communion. That's the truest communion. Because he says, I'll partake of it in my kingdom. And his kingdom is here. 
I don't know why people are waiting. That's why they're holding on to the symbol for. Because half of the church world believes that the kingdom is not even here yet. Luke chapter 17. Please take a look at this. What Jesus said about the kingdom of God. People are waiting for a future kingdom. That's why they're holding on to the symbol. But Jesus said the kingdom is with you. I will drink it with you anew in my Father's kingdom. And the kingdom of God is here amongst us. Luke chapter 17. And look at verse 20. Luke 17 and verse 20. And he says, And when he was de demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall you say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is already within you. So uh, when we're holding on to a symbol, we're actually removing the life and the power that the cross wants to demonstrate in our lives. That's why the Lord said to me, what are you doing? Because unbeknownst to myself, I was removing the power of God and the life of God from the cross itself. Because of, because of what we do. It's a symbol. It's not a symbol. It's a reality. When the reality has come, you don't need the symbol no more. When the reality has come, you don't need the shadow of it anymore. Yet people today are living in shadows because they don't have the reality of the living Christ. And when you don't have the reality of the living Christ, you continue to live in the shadow. Now, what is the scriptural account? The scriptural account is seen actually in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Because the reality is, the communion table or the communion supper is shared between us. The word communion comes from the Greek word kononia. It means partnership, intercourse, or sharing together. So the true breaking of the bread comes when the body is broken in fellowship between us. That is the true scriptural communion. When we break Christ between each other, we are having communion. The reason why we need the symbol of the cracker and the grape juice is because we're too busy complaining and bickering at one another. And by the time we get outside in the, in, the, in the parking lot, we're cursing each other because we want to get to the parking lot first. And we have no time to break Christ between each other. And because we don't break Christ, we need the symbol to hang on to it. Look at this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I want to give you the passage of Scripture to show this to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Can you see how much religious... the religiosity that we've been carrying for so many years? 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Look at verse 16. Look what he says here, the cup of blessing which we bless is not the communion of the blood of Christ. The bread which we break is not the communion of the body of Christ. Look at what he says here, for we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. It's meaning to say that we don't remember what Christ did 2,000 years ago, but now we break the bread of Christ between us. We break Christ between us. And as we break Christ between us and the body is being broken, that is the true communion that we are to be having. When you break Christ open out of your own life, and I see Christ in you, I've just had communion. That's communion, that's fellowship, that's sharing. That is the true communion supper, because I am eating of Christ from you. Amen. When you come here and say, man, I thank you for being filled, because you're having communion, we're breaking Christ open, and I'm feeding you Christ. Because Christ cannot be eaten with the physical mouth. You cannot take Christ into the physical mouth, either literally or symbolically. 
To take li it literally is witchcraft. To take it symbolically is stupidity. <laughs> spiritual stupidity. To think that you're taking Christ in a symbolic way is spiritual stupidity and you have not yet been awakened to the reality of the new covenants. Revelation chapter 3, come on. I got more to say yet. I hope I got the time. Look at this. Revelation, come on. Chapter 3. Look at verse 20. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will do what? And will sup with him and he with me. That is a true communion table. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, when we break Christ, we're transformed. Now, I want you to turn with me very quickly. I'm going to end with this. Turn to Genesis chapter 14. So if I can recollect your Bible study, you'll remember that Abraham met Melchizedek. Remember that? And what did Abraham do when he met Melchizedek? It says that he broke the bread and the wine. Abraham shared bread and wine with Melchizedek. Let's read that. Genesis chapter 14 and verse 18. Look at this. Let's in verse 18, Genesis chapter 14 and verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and blessed and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which had delivered thine enemies into thy hands, and he gave him tithes of all. Notice what Melchizedek did when he met Abraham. He broke the bread and the wine. This is... The element, now notice this. this. These are the elements of the communion table. Even when we do it in a symbolic manner, what is it? The elements of the communion table are the wine and the crackers. The elements of the communion table are the bread and the wine, which are symbolic of the, of the flesh and the blood. But they go a little bit even further, because Jesus said, Eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. Listen to this, and I'll close with this. The bread and the wine, the flesh and the blood, were the elements that we receive under the new covenants. When Melchizedek broke the bread and the wine, he was confirming the covenant that he was about to, God, God was about to make with Abraham. And the, 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 the elements that confirmed the covenants was the bread and the wine. Jesus had the Passover meal and he broke the bread and the wine. Broke the bread and then drank the wine. The, let, say it with me. The elements of the new covenants are the bread and the wine. The flesh and the blood. You hear that? Now, what's the reality of it? Because remember, bread and wine are just symbolic. But what it's just speaking of here, the reality of it has been given to us by the living word and the quickening spirit. The living word is the flesh of God and the quickening spirit is the blood of his spirit. You see that? The elements of the new covenant are his word, his living word, and his quickening spirit. The bread and the wine, the flesh and the blood. Which breaks down to this, the Word and the Spirit. In the New Covenant, we're not, given the, the, we're not given the elements in a symbolic way. Of bread and wine, or even flesh and blood. But we're given the reality of those symbols, which, are, which is the living Word of God, and the quickening power of the Holy Spirit. 
And these are the elements of the new covenant which we are under right now. Because without the Word and without the Spirit, we can't walk with Christ. We can't sup with Christ. We can't talk with Christ. We can't do nothing. Outside of the living Word and the quickening Spirit, what happens to us is that we become, just become religious. Jesus said, eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. And they all ran from him. Because what was he saying? His flesh was his word. His blood was his spirit. His life. And here we are playing stupid religious games with crackers and grape juice. And yet we're so bound up with traditions and carnality that we cannot really partake of the true communion which consists of a living word and the quickening power of the Holy Spirit. You see, when we break Christ open, we're partaking of the elements of that new covenant, His word and His spirit. Without His word, there is no life. Without His spirit, there is no life. And that's what God has given to us in the reality of the new covenant. He's given us His Word and His Spirit. These are the truest elements of the truest communion that we can ever have with Christ and each other. When we break the body open, this is what we should be eating of. We should be eating a living Word and, a, and, and the power of God that quickens our spirit. And let me say to you something. Those that cannot partake of a living Word, you can sit here, 24 hours a day and listen to me. You can take the tapes and listen to them 24 hours a day and sit here. But if they don't become living words, and if the Holy Spirit does not quicken it, then you have not partaken of any communion, and you can sit there and drink the grape juice and a cracker all you want. It ain't going to do nothing for you. How sad it is that people will gather once a month and partake of it, and it doesn't, it will not, I, I can say to you that it will not do nothing. It does nothing for nobody. Because it's physical elements, and physical elements cannot do nothing for the new covenant man. The only thing that, that, that the new covenant man can receive is that which proceeds from his spirit, and that which proceeds from the word. When we're able to break the word open, and receive a living word, and have that word come alive in our hearts, and we partake of the power of the Holy Spirit, then that has just been the true communion table. We've just eaten Christ and drank of His life. The reason why the churches today are bound by tradition and religiosity is because they have never partaken of a true communion supper. They're bound up with traditional teachings and doctrines of men. That's what we like to hear. And, and we sit around and hear the doctrines of men and the traditions of men all day long, and then we pull out the cracker and the grape juice and we have a communion service. How nice. That really makes a lot of sense. Because we're ignorant of God's words. We're still hanging on to symbols because we have not yet received the life through faith. That's why we need the symbol for because let me tell you something, as long as I got the reality of His Word, I don't need no cracker and grape, even as a symbol, because a symbol holds no power for me. A symbol holds no power. It's nothing but something that stands in the shadow. Why in the world would I want to partake of a shadow when I have the reality of it? And don't be deceived, people. We, we in our own, because of our religious upbringing, there's no way that we're going to sit here and just, again, and say, this is symbolic. No, there's no life in it whatsoever. So I believe that this concludes part one of what I wanted to say. That the true communion is the elements, do you hear that? The elements of the new covenants. The elements. We're not under an old covenant anymore. That was in shadows. Did you hear me? In shadows, in priesthood, in temple, in literal physical, we're not longer under that covenant no more. We're under a new covenant which has been raised into the life and into the spirit through His words. And look at how ignorant we've become. We're still hanging on to a symbol. When Christ has given us His life, 
Why? How can the world, can I justify a symbol when the reality has come? It, the reason why I'm holding on to the symbol, again, it's because I have not yet experienced or I have not yet understood the reality of it. I have not yet understood the reality of a living word and the power of God that quickens my spirit into, immort haven't I, into immortality. I have not yet received that. We're playing religious games. So I conclude this message by leaving us with the same question that the Holy Spirit gave to me some 15 years ago. What are we doing? If we insist to hold on to the symbol, then the life has not come. But we've got the life. We are under a new covenant. And God confirmed that covenant that He gave to us by causing the Word of God to be made real, become like living flesh, and allowing His Holy Spirit to live within us by His quickening Spirit. Therefore, the symbol of the bread and the wine was now lifted into the reality of His life. Just stand to your feet, please. Please.